The aim of this lecture is to give you an overview about some of the most popular and in-demand nootropics. As the title suggests, the discussion is the role of nootropic drugs and nutrients in the aging individual, or in other words, the healthy or normal individual. This is of course a category that no country's approval body has accepted to date. As such, we will be viewing this information on the basis of international research and experience. The interest around nootropics is indicative of the nature of all real anti-aging medicine. To spot the very earliest signs of change and to take measures to slow, avert or even reverse the path of deterioration before it becomes a disease. Nootropics are the so-called smart drugs and were first highlighted in the popular books written by Ward Dean, John Morgenthaler and Stephen Folkes, who later founded the Cognitive Enhancement Research Institute in California. Both are an excellent source of information on this subject. Mental deterioration is a common problem, often the butt of jokes and an almost accepted, dare I say, natural effect associated with ageing. Some neurologists have stated that if we all lived long enough, we would all become senile. The problems normally begin with occasional forgetfulness of relatively unimportant information, slowness of thought, lack of concentration and shortness of attention span. But clearly, these are all indicators that our mental facilities are not operating at an optimal level. The goal is to spot the signs. Often incidental and perhaps even immaterial at first, they may be associated with mental degeneration. The science of nootropics blossomed in 1972 after the demonstration of the pharmacological uniqueness of piracetam. It led Dr. Gajira to formulate an entirely new category of drugs, which he named nootropics, which is Greek, meaning towards the mind. He defined nootropics as follows. They should enhance learning and memory. They should enhance resistance of learned behaviours or memories to conditions which tend to disrupt them. They should protect the brain against various physical or chemical injuries. They should increase the efficacy of the cortical and subcortical control mechanisms. And finally, they should lack the usual pharmacology of other psychotropic drugs and possess very few side effects and have extremely low toxicity. It is probably true to say that today the classification is used in a wider sense, but that was the original definition developed by the founding scientist. So, let us consider the primary areas of action that any nootropic can enhance to ultimately influence the level of a neurotransmitter. Here, there are various possibilities, including inhibition, for example, reuptake inhibitors. There are also the inhibition of enzymes that would otherwise break down neurotransmitters, for example, monoamine oxidase. Although extremely rare, there are now even accelerators, actually increasing neurotransmitter uptake, and although not understood yet, this has also been shown to enhance function. Agonists stimulate the production of a given neurotransmitter, and under this heading I also include the precursors, chemicals that pass through the blood-brain barrier and stimulate the actions of specific neurotransmitters. Plus methylation, the conversion of one chemical to another, often utilising key nutrients such as the B vitamins and their cofactors. A number of substances have been shown to improve the electrical activity of the brain. Vasodilation is the improvement of blood circulation, essential given that in the case of the brain, the blood has to travel through some of the smallest arteries in the body to supply nutrients for energy. Although closely associated with blood circulation, there are additional energy factors that can come into force, for example increasing the uptake of glucose. Receptor sensitivity falls upon another novel category, whereby particular substances can upgrade receptors to react more aggressively to the given stimulus without actually increasing chemical levels. A good example of this would be the new drug, modafinil. Finally, the category of membrane, where we will see that good membrane health is also a function in cerebral fitness. Just before we look closely at some of the leading nootropics, let us consider some facts and figures about the brain. 
Typically, the human brain weighs about three pounds, representing two to three percent of total body weight. It is estimated to contain 10 to 100 billion neurons and approximately 10 times more glial cells, the structural and nutritional support cells surrounding neurons. But whilst the brain weighs 3% of body weight, it normally receives about 15% of the body's total blood supply and 15% of the body's total inhaled oxygen. The brain must use this oxygen, along with its chief fuel glucose, to produce and burn approximately 20% of the body's total adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Unlike most cells which can burn either fat or glucose for their energy production needs, neurons can only burn glucose under normal, non-starvation conditions and they can consume 50% of the total blood sugar. Unlike liver and muscle cells which can store large amounts of sugar as glycogen, neurons can only store at most a minute or two's worth of glucose. Thus, they are extremely dependent on a continuous and uninterrupted blood supply to maintain normal energy metabolism and avoid injury or death. Most other cells reproduce continually throughout a lifetime. Yet, after the brain reaches a full complement of neurons at about two years of age, neurons never reproduce, so they are an irreplaceable essential of life. Under normal conditions of adequate oxygen supply, neurons convert glucose into energy, as ATP, through a three-phase process. The first phase occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell and is called aerobic, oxygen-using glycolysis. Glucose is metabolised into ATP and, in addition, pyruvic acid is produced. This is then metabolised through the Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria to generate more ATP. An additional energy-rich substance, NADH, is also produced. NADH is the coenzyme of vitamin B3. It is also transported to the mitochondria where it serves as a fuel in the third phase of energy metabolism, the electron transport side chain to produce more ATP. So, ultimately, through the successful interaction of aerobic glycolysis, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, a single molecule of glucose can yield a maximum of 38 molecules of ATP bioenergy. This is assuming that there is adequate oxygen for both the glycolysis and the mitochondrial respiratory metabolism. However, when neurons are undersupplied with oxygen, a different form of sugar burning occurs, called anaerobic, without oxygen glycolysis. Here, for each molecule of glucose burned, only two molecules of ATP are produced. Also, instead of producing the valuable Krebs cycle fuel pyruvic acid, anaerobic glycolysis produces the somewhat toxic waste product, lactic acid. To summarise, when glucose brain fuel is burned without adequate oxygen, it produces only 5% as much ATP energy as when glucose is burned with adequate oxygen. Essentially, there are three main uses for ATP inside neurons. That's maintenance, electrical and neurotransmitter functions. Since neurons don't reproduce and must last a lifetime, they are continually expending energy to repair or replace various cell components. Neurons also use ATP to produce, transport, package, secrete and reuptake neurotransmitters which provide cell-to-cell -cell communication. Massive amounts of ATP are necessary to facilitate the frequent discharges of electrical energy from the receiving end of the neuron, the dendrites, through the cell body, where the signal processing occurs, and down to the transmitting end, the axon. For this electrical process to occur, there must be a rapid and continuous exchange of sodium and potassium ions back and forth across the neuronal membranes. This exchange process depends on the sodium-potassium pumps powered by sodium-potassium ATPase enzyme systems. It has been estimated that as much as 45% of a neuron's ATP may be used to power these pumps. 
So it should be evident why unconsciousness rapidly occurs if breathing stops or if brain blood flow is interrupted even briefly. As the delivery of oxygen to the brain halts, neurons rapidly shift from aerobic to anaerobic energy metabolism with a consequent drop in energy production of 95%. There will simply not be enough ATP energy to make neuronal electrical activity and neurotransmitter discharge possible, the electrochemical basis for consciousness. Plus, if aerobic metabolism ceases for too long, eventually either irreparable damage or even cell death may occur, as even the maintenance neuronal activities fall behind due to the energy shortage. Now, of course, for most of us, falling unconscious or suffering brain death due to cessation of breathing or brain blood flow is not a regular problem to contend with, but a more subtle, insidious, slow-developing form of brain energy crisis can and does occur, to some degree, over a lifetime, in the form of cerebral arteriosclerosis, mini-strokes or transient ischemic attacks. In other words, brief interruptions of brain blood supply often due to blood vessel spasm. In its early stages, this brain energy crisis may lead to only the slightest of symptoms, subtle memory impairment, occasional confusion or lapses in concentration, more difficulty in learning, etc. But at a more advanced stage, the brain energy crisis may manifest itself as senility and eventually may terminate in coma or death. Dr. Branconia noted, The severity of the dementia is directly correlated to the loss of functional brain tissue, independent of the primary neuropathology. This view is consistent with evidence from studies of cerebral blood flow, oxygen uptake and glucose utilisation that have shown that brain carbohydrate metabolism is impaired in a variety of dementias, and that the degree of reduction in brain carbohydrate metabolism is correlated with the severity of the dementia. Orthomolecular pioneer Abram Hoffer has suggested that when the brain oxygenation becomes deficient, neurons switch to anaerobic glycolysis as their main energy source. This may provide enough energy for the neurons to survive, but it will not provide enough energy to power their functional roles as electrochemical signal processors and transmitters. Then, the affected neurons will be offline, in an electrically idling state. But if normal aerobic metabolism is restored before irreparable cell damage or death occurs, then the neurons and their functions can be restored. What we have attempted to indicate here is the massive and constant energy demands of the brain and the critical consequences if energy production is interrupted for even a brief period. During the course of ageing, there is a gradual decline in blood flow, reducing energy production capability and altering neuronal and mitochondrial structure, etc., which will be discussed later. Plus, we strongly believe that the accumulation of toxins, particularly heavy metals such as mercury, can rapidly speed up this process.